to another episode of the engineering side of data. I've got a couple people joining me here today. First one is Michael Meyer. He's going to be the co-host for this episode. Uh, Mike has been doing some work in Data Vault, and that is the subject, by the way. Uh, he's just starting his Data Vault journey. And so, um, and he's also my very first guest on this podcast. So go back and check out his episode if you haven't already heard it. We talk about cloud data warehousing. And of course, our guest here today is Cindy Meyerson. Cindy, would you please introduce yourself? Sure, I'd be happy to, Bob. Thank you. Um, I uh, started a company called Data Rebels uh, back in 2017 after uh, being in uh, the consulting arena for about 20 years. I spent about 17 years in the uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence agency working as a developer. Uh, and um, as part of that journey, uh, I was handed um, a couple of data warehouse projects over the years. So I had tried a number of different techniques. I have worked with data warehousing when third normal form. Uh, we built a, a Kimball Star Schema warehouse. Um, and so I was, I was looking for a better way. And this was while I was a, a, a contractor inside of the, the government. Um, and I stumbled across Data Vault. So that started my Data Vault journey and actually kicked me into a, a whole new career. I uh, fell in love with the solution, with the methodology. Uh, I have a systems engineering uh, background. Um, I got my uh, master's in systems engineering from George Washington University. And so, you know, you look at systems of systems and I start looking at these data warehouses and it's, uh, it's a perfect match. And I just uh, was looking for a better way. And uh, actually over the years of, of teaching Data Vault, I find that a lot of my students and companies that are interested in Data Vault find it along the same path. They're looking for a better way. They're tired of repeating the same mistakes. Their business is breathing down their backs because they've been working on a data warehousing project for two years and they're not getting any value out of it. Uh, so in that sort of arena, I, I walked out of uh, consulting and I took a big jump and I started my own business, Data Rebels. Um, this was after having uh, worked with Dan Linstead for a number of years. I'd gone through the Data Vault training and he asked me if I would become an instructor, um, which I was flattered and, and honored. And, um, and of course, I said yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I've been working with Dan uh, since about uh, 2015. And um, so I started Data Rebels uh, as an education business as well as a um, consulting business, but not consulting from the standard consulting concept. My focus, Data Rebels focus, is to enable the clients that I have to be self-sufficient. I believe that um, my goal is to actually teach men to fish. Um, yeah, and a lot of contracting companies don't really like that concept because that's not necessarily how their model, their business model works. But I like to be very strategic, uh, very tactical in what I do, go in and help a team get up and get running, uh, get them on the data vault journey, give them oversight when it's necessary. I basically follow the data vault practice of get in, get the data and get out. So I really want to help a team um, learn how to implement properly, stay on the road. So that's what Data Rebels is about. Um, and then uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, Dan asked me if I would um, step up for Data Vault Alliance and asked me to be their chief operating officer. So I'm sort of juggling two, if you will, global businesses right now. Um, so I am the COO of Data Vault Alliance. Um, Data Vault Alliance is basically the standards board for all things Data Vault. Um, Dan, as you know, Dan Lindstedt is the uh, inventor of Data Vault. And um, so he holds the standards. Uh, our goal and our focus at Data Vault Alliance is to provide excellence in training and education to maintain the standards uh, and to support our authorized training partners uh, globally. Um, so, uh, and to help our community. Uh, one of the things that I love working 
with Dan. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I, I, I should say that I love working with Dan so much is that um, his heart has always been to help people, to help businesses. And it, and it comes through in so many different ways. That's why he brought Data Vault to the public arena um, out of Lockheed Martin. We could talk about that, but um, he's just a joy to work with. Um, our other partner at Data Vault Alliance is Sanjay Panda. Uh, Sanjay is a brilliant, also a brilliant man, um, has had a lot of work uh, in um, artificial intelligence. Uh, he is um, considered a Data Vault master. He worked with Dan for probably 17 years. He met Dan when he was at Purdue University and also uh, worked with him uh, on a project at uh, the Edmonton uh, Police Force up in Canada. So he's had a lot of experience. He's just a, a wonderful person. Both of them are. So I'm, I'm really fortunate um, to, to have such great partners. Oh, great. I appreciate the introduction there. Um, and thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank you um, for having me. Yeah. Why don't we dive in a little bit more about what is Data Vault? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> and I get this all the time. Um, the, the Data Vault is, a, is an engineered solution for business intelligence or analytics. Uh, it is a methodology, an architecture, a model, and implementation guidelines and standards. So most people, when they talk about Data Vault, they only want to focus on the model, which is um, a, a terrible mistake. Uh, because uh, I, what I try to tell my classes is, you know, building a hub link and satellite does not a Data Vault make. Right? <laughs> uh, and uh, so Data Vault really is a whole solution. Um, the beauty of Data Vault is it's founded, its core is based on CMMI. Um, it is, was completely built around the capability maturity model. And so as a engineered solution for data analytics, it incorporates some of the best practices and principles, disciplines out of engineering to help solve these real world problems, the things that we keep doing over and over again, even as an industry. So uh, Data Vault as a solution uh, provides a way forward. It has all of the components necessary to build out a full system of business intelligence or analytics. And it incorporates people, process, and technology. Most people, when they think about an analytic solution, focus on the technology. Uh, and that is a huge mistake. So we focus on people. I find that <laughs> I find that in my practices, in my years of, of working, um, that uh, people are the biggest problem. It's not the data. <laughs> Sometimes it's not the technology, right? Uh, it's people, getting people to move in the right direction. So one of the uh, key methods inside of Data Vault is the whole idea of true agility and how to work in an agile fashion. That is core to Data Vault methodology. Uh, we work very closely with Scott Ambler um, who is the creator of the disciplined agile delivery method of, of agile uh, process. So um, it's all embedded inside of Data Vault. So it's a very holistic approach. So when we talk about the Data Vault model, you can talk about hubs, links, and satellites, but that is the way I, I have often phrased this with Dan when we're talking about you know, the model, and I have people ask me about the model, is that the model, in my opinion, is simply um, an optimized enabler for the rest of the methodology. The core of the, the methodology and the architecture are supported through the model, but you can take the principles that we teach about how to actually build, how to work with your teams, um, you know, concepts of master data, data governance, all of that is built in, how you architect for scalability. Uh, how do you how you architect uh, your processes, for example, uh, to uh, ensure that you're not refactoring, you know, in three months or a year down the road, right? Um, all of those kinds of principles are are founded in data management techniques and data engineering techniques and have been around for a long time. 
uh, they're not necessarily new. Uh, so the foundation of Data Vault is uh, built on, you know, we would say the shoulders of giants, right? Um, Bill Inman, the father of data warehousing, uh, is uh, had quite a bit to do with the way uh, that Dan uh, worked through some of the modeling um, challenges that his team had at Lockheed. So uh, as a whole, as a foundation, Data Vault borrows from total quality management. Uh, it borrows from Six Sigma for error reduction, and we see a lot of that in our practice uh, with regard to how we look at complex processes. So Data Vault is much, much more than a model. And as I said, to me, the model is the optimized enabler for the methodology and the architecture. Um, it, it just bodes very well, and they all fit together quite nicely. So what I think is funny is when I start talking about Data Vault, people are like, well, where do we go purchase it? <laughs> no, no, don't buy it off the shelf. It's nothing that you buy off the shelf. It, that was the first thing that kind of got people back on their heels. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, yeah, yeah you kind of dig in deeper. You got to read about it. You got to understand the methodology. So and that's, Data Vault I, in I the cloud? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's that, to me, that was, all, that, was, that was a lot of fun kind of getting through that first conversation. Um, so, uh, Cindy, what do you think are some of the main advantages then of Data Vault? Well, uh, for one thing, as I said, because uh, Data Vault was built in inside of Lockheed, so if we go back to look at the Data Vault story. You know, where did it come from? Um, so Dan was hired in Lockheed into Lockheed Martin uh, in their astronomics division. He was young buck and uh, you know new kid on the block, I, I will say, and he was hired into Lockheed. And of course, they did what happens to so many people coming in that are new and don't, it's like being voluntold, you know, yeah. you know that feeling, you know, yeah. don't miss a meeting because you'll be voluntold, right? Um, and so they handed him a project that was, uh, the, the worst night was like the, like a tsunami, right? They handed him a project. It had very little sponsorship, very little funding. And they basically said, we want you to build us a data warehouse. By the way, we have 250 source systems and we want it in six months. Um, how do you do that? Now, now, uh, so, you know, Dan said, okay, right? He took it. And so they actually delivered 125 source systems in six months to Lockheed, operational with business value. But uh, Dan had a very small team, and this is one of the reasons why Data Vault is also, um, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting approach because uh, instead of saying you need, you know, a team of 20 developers and everybody, they actually, he had a team of three people, um, including himself. He had, excuse me, four people with himself. He had uh, a, a, um, a mainframe programmer that Lockheed did like, it's kind of like, you know, um, what is that? What is that movie where they, they have the guy in the office and they keep moving. He ends up in the basement and he, all he wants is his red, his red stapler, right? Like, you know, office so, space. you know, there's one of these guys that they, you know, he, the guy was brilliant. He was, you know, he, he understood all of the systems inside of the astronomics division that were running through the mainframe. He understood the data, but he was never allowed to learn anything new. He was one of those critical employees that got stuck, which we see quite frequently. Mm -hmm. their, their, uh, their corporate knowledge is so strong that they can't, the business thinks they can't afford to let them do anything else, right? Yes. Um, and we see that uh, frequently. And so... He was grumpy. Nobody wanted to talk, you know, like people didn't want to deal with him. But Dan went to him and said, if I can, if I can let you do something new, would you help our team? And the guy was like, absolutely, I'm on board. He also had a very, uh, extremely experienced seasoned uh, database um, uh, modeler and uh, DBA architect. And she taught him so much and was extremely, um, you know, uh, uh, a huge contributor to the entire model when they started tearing things down and, and sort of looking into, you know, how do we make this thing as flexible as possible? Uh, because, oh, by the way, <laughs> they had two government uh, 
clients, if you will, that were part, as you can imagine, astronomics were launching rockets and, and things like that. So NASA was one of their clients and there was another Intel agency that was one of their clients as well. And so one of the challenges um, that, that the agency uh, gave Dan was basically anything you build on the commercial side, um, you have to be able to throw over the wall to us without breaking what we're doing over here behind, behind closed doors. And of, uh, there were a number of, there were three challenges that they gave, they gave him, and that was the one challenge that no one had been able to successfully satisfy. And so he took that challenge back to his team, and this is where you get the flexibility in the model, okay? It's optimized to take advantage of these things. Um, and so, so out of that, that, they worked through those processes um, and defined the techniques that worked best. And they did that over 10 years. So from 1990 to 2000, this was how Lockheed in astronomics approached data warehousing, how they satisfied their government contractors. And oh, by the way, they were 100% auditable, which is key. If we talk about trustworthiness of data and the criticality of that, because you know as well as I do, if you're if your consumers don't trust your product, they're going to work around you, which is where we get a lot of these silos and people going off and building their own thing. And then none of the numbers match. I mean, we've all seen this. And the only way to stop something like that is to actually build, I would say, build organically based on business concepts right, that can be auditable back to the source systems. And so that is how Dan's team built. That's all of those methods and techniques. Mm -hmm. All of that is inside of Data Vault. And when he came out of Lockheed in 2000, Lockheed gave him permission to take that methodology out and, um, and then begin to teach and sell it. It was something uh, that, that his team had built. Uh, the other thing that uh, Lockheed did that people don't know about necessarily is um, that they actually developed 30,000 test cases on DataVault in that 10 year period, testing the process, the approaches, uh, the, the quality, how, how to build rigor in so that you can test to make sure that your model is correct. Are you 100% auditable? Can you absorb changes without impact and refactoring? 30,000 test cases. And so the test cases he was not allowed to take out, but he was able yeah. to take the methodology, <laughs> the architecture, and the techniques. And that is where Data Vault came from. That's what it was born in. Yeah, I, the, you hit so many key spots. So I think the last one you just said, the refactoring. So, um, you know, in organizations I've been, as the, as the warehouse tends to be there for a while, the refactoring just becomes, well, they're like, uh, you know, business, like, why is this taking so long? Because mm -hmm. you're having to tear apart so many different moving pieces in your different layers of your architecture that you're supporting to do this. And it takes a long time uh, versus the way that you look at Data Vault and how Data Vault addresses that completely, you know, uh, different, different way and just a, so much of a better way of handling that. I think that that's key. And I think that's where, um, Right away, some of our uh, uh, business intelligence leads said, yeah, that would be phenomenal to be able to do some of those things versus what we have to do today. That's a great point, Mike. Yeah, um, as I said when we, before we started recording, uh, you know, one of the, the problems with talking about Data Vault is mm -hmm. the breadth of what mm -hmm. it is. And sometimes people take that breadth and they think, oh, this is just, you know, it took us two years to do what we've been doing for years over and over again. You know, this new methodology is going to take 10 times as long and, and it is so wrong. Um, and I understand where that comes from, but but you have to look at the actual methodology and the agility and those agile because it came out of lean initiatives. Right. We didn't call it agile at mm -hmm. that time. It was all lean initiatives. Um, and so. Uh, the, the ideas that you're talking about with refactoring, one of the one of the huge benefits of Data Vault is that you can grow, you can scale, you can absorb new data sources into a Data Vault. Um, I, I hate to use the word warehouse because it has a bad name, but into a Data Vault warehouse, we call it uh, in, uh, enterprise memory. 
right? So because that's really what you're talking about is how do you capture all that enterprise memory and as that grows, how do you deal with that without re-engineering? Um, one of the, the, I would say, one of the downfalls of a Kimball star schema is the level of conformity. You know, Kimball, when you look at Kimball's architecture, he talks about um, a, a data warehouse being what is held as the data, right, comes through the, the, the transformational processes into the data warehouse. We would call that, in Data Vault, we call that an information warehouse. It's not raw data. It's not a data warehouse. It truly, what Kimball was building, is an information warehouse. Right? The data was curated, the data was transformed, the data was conformed right? and translated and business rules are applied. That level of complexity kills agility. Yeah. And what we say in Data Vault is we want to take that complexity, which causes refactoring, and we want to move that downstream. So in a Data Vault implementation, we truly want the raw data because how do you how do you audit your data when you've already had all these transformational rules applied to it? How do you reproduce the source system for an auditor and show them this is where the data came from? Um, this is how the data was stored in its raw format. Mine are what we call hard rules and soft rules. Hard rules only are applied moving data into uh, the data warehouse. Hard rules would be something like, you know, picking up string data or textual data that uh, is in a CSV file, for example. You know, a date is a date, a number is a number, a string is a string. Those kind of hard data attribution uh, rules that you apply to make sure that when the data lands in, the raw, in, in your raw vault, what we call our raw vault, our enterprise data warehouse, that a date is a date, a string is a string, a number is a number, because in the source system, that's actually what it is. Because the source system landed that perhaps into a text file or a CSV file, it should have been a date, it should have been a number. So that's that, those are part of, you know, sort of the, the fast, if you will, the fast ways of moving data from source to target. As I said, we wanna get in and get the data and get out, which I mentioned earlier before we started the, re the recording, it's one of the targets. When you do that, it leaves the complexity that's involved in applying business rules downstream between the raw vault and what we would call our information delivery layer. And in that information delivery layer, you can have star schemas, you can have cubes, you can have flat white, it doesn't matter. It's whatever the consumer requires. By landing the data in, our, in, in its raw form, if you will, and I'm not talking about just not doing any quality cleansing or anything like that. There are places for that, and we can talk about that. But uh, when we land the data, it gives it multiple, you know, extensive utility because you're not applying the business rules to the data as it moves in, right? If a business rule changes, you have to replay that data through the new version of the business rule for that subset of data. And what we say is don't do that land the data in its raw form, apply the minimum rules of uh, required, hard rules required, um, apply a variety of system fields that we have, system components to it, so you can manage it, right? You know when the data landed, you know where it came from, lineage, traceability, all of those pieces are part of uh, the data vault construct. And then when you move the data, when someone uh, looks at the data, we, we talk about um, consumers wanting data and they want their version of the truth. Um, I have a fundamental problem with that because, well, anyway, that's a philosophical, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, theological <laughs> discussion. But, but uh, what I like to, what we talk about in Data Vault is that we want to hold in the raw vault a version of the facts, right? And from the facts, you can put different perspectives on top of that, right? Like marketing has a perspective of certain pieces of data that finance has a very different perspective of. And it's the same data element. They just, their perspective is different. How do you do that if you conform the data on the way into the raw vault? And a lot of, in, 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 or in a Kimball, into an information market, right? Or information warehouse. The, the other thing that you have to deal with with, with refactoring is what happens when the rules change, 
right? We have policy changes if you're in finance, if you're in healthcare. So many of uh, our, our data source systems have various policies that have to be applied, right, to the data, um, to the way things are calculated. What happens when those rules change? And if you've played the data through and landed the data with that particular version of the policy applied, you've got to replay the data right, to get the new policy in. We say, let's move those types of complex changing business rules closer to the consumer so that you have your data and you have this flexibility and adaptability to take that raw data and put a different lens on it, if you will. The other thing we like to do is with, this, with regard to um, business rules is to separate business rules that must be applied uh, by IT, for example, common business rules. We take like an 80-20 kind of rule. If 80% of the corporation requires this calculation, let IT management. The other 20%, we push that downstream to the business users because they want to be able to work with their own data, but there has to be governance. And so we, we want to make sure we have governance in place. We want to make sure we have security in place. And security should be first and foremost at the beginning of every single, you know, I would say data analytics solution stand up. If you don't understand what you need to secure, don't start building <laughs> because you need to build that in up front, right? You at least have a plan for it. So, um, so if you move the business rules downstream, then refactoring, if you have to refactor a business rule, the impact to the rest of the data is non-existent. You've already got the data to work with. So you're just working with the business rules at that point. So, yeah. sorry, and that is, answer to a to No, but that is huge. And that's the key component because if you, and you wrapped all that really great together because like today, if I'm looking for certain business rules, I might have to, in our in different systems that we've done over the years, I might have to look in five or six places. I don't have one place to go. Some of them are close to the source. Some are in different layers within the warehouses that extends today. So first of all, to even find an answer a question on what, what are the rules applying can take a long time. And then second, you know, trying to serve that up to your true business owners of that data for them to make decisions on those rules. They're like, well, can you show me one spot where they're at so we can go over them? Uh, no, that's a little bit difficult today. Right. But so, so when we started talking about data vault with our business users, they were excited from that fact, we'd have one place we'd go back and reevaluate those rules to make sure that they're, the ones that you, like you said, are enterprise wide, that they are actually visible and then they can review from time to time and make sure that that's the, they're the right rule. So that's huge. That is so huge to me anyway. Yeah. So one of, one of, uh, you know, so if you think about um, an enterprise data warehouse, if we'll, we'll use that word, um, and I'm, I actually want to get to the definition of a warehouse because a lot of people don't even understand what the definition of warehouse is. Um, and which is why data warehousing quote got a bad name. But um, the thing about good engineering practices in data, right, uh, in governance and things like that is that you should be versioning. So in Data Vault, we version everything, our scripts, our models, our business rules, anything and everything that touches the data we version. And people go, well, why? Why would you? Why would you do that? Well, if you're audited against a report that was written three years ago, and you've changed the business rules over the year, and you've even changed the model over the years, and you've changed the views, and you've changed the load processes because the the business rules, if you're working with a conform dimension, business rules have changed over the year, right? How do you, for an auditor, go back out of that data and reproduce what you did three years ago? You can't, right? So when we talk about auditability, one of the things with Data Vault is when certain things change and they change at a source system that requires a modification in the model, we take one of two approaches. We either create a new object for it so that we preserve what was done in the past and we begin, and this has to do with changes in grain, for example, mm -hmm. right? Which is a killer if you're in a star scheme, a change the grain and everything falls apart. Or people join tables that they thought were supposed to be joined together on a set of keys 
and then they wonder why they get these incredible Cartesians and their numbers are incorrect, right? So we, we see all this happening. What we say in Data Vault is uh, when we look at a relationship, for example, between business keys, which really defines the granularity of the data underneath, when we look at, uh, at that type of thing and we see that there's a grain change, we don't say, well, let's modify that link structure and let's just, you know, remove this key or add these extra keys and then we'll try to refactor everything. We don't do that. That is a completely different relationship being uh, basically uh, constructed in an object than previous. Build a new link, populate that new link, right? With those relationships, get that data correct. Don't try to refactor. And this is one method that we use. The other thing is what happens when the descriptive data on a source system changes. You know, you do an upgrade. I I, I was a PeopleSoft developer for about 14 years. Anybody know anything about PeopleSoft? Every time you do an upgrade, right? And inside the government, nothing is vanilla because they're special. And so everything has to be done, you know, in a, in a very custom way, right? And so every time we did an upgrade, there was almost like an 18 month uh, you know, ramp up to make sure we captured all the changes that had been made, all of the customizations, and then apply that to the next version, right? And of course, you know, the, the underlying base tables are changing also. And so what do you do with something like that? Well, Data Vault, we don't say, well, let's refactor the model with, that's capturing or satellites that are capturing the history. Build a new satellite to capture any of those changes and load from there. And so what you see when we talk about being able to quickly absorb changes, if there's a change like that, you're not touching anything you've built before. So the refactoring, Mike, is not just, it's not a preservation of, of what has been built in a process. It also extends to the model. You absorb the change and then you keep moving forward. And by the way, you haven't touched anything else in the model. One of the, you know, across the landscape, of, of what you're building for the enterprise. Because if you look at a third normal form, if you, it's very deep, right? And so, and, and there are tremendous dependencies in there. And so if you make a change at, at, at any point in the model, you are probably impacting a number of things. There is a cascading effect to that. In Data Vault, that doesn't occur. We are not deep, we are wide. With each concept you build on, you bolt on to it, and it's at most three layers deep, at most. And so the impacts on change are minimal, which is why, again, I go back to the model is, is an optimized enabler for the methodology as a whole. Um, and so uh, you're not refactoring your model, you're not refactoring the processes, because the processes you built to load the data up to this point remain the same. If I have to load a new satellite, I build a new process. I don't have to touch anything else. So I won't say there is no re-engineering because that would be like a lie, <laughs> but there's minimal, <laughs> right? The idea is that is minimal impact um, to the model, uh, to the data, to the processes, to the orchestration, uh, to the downstream outcomes, there's minimal impact when you build this way. Perfect. Yeah, I agree. And that, that's the exciting part. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that in action. <laughs> right on. Um, so you mentioned some of the, the tables and modeling concepts earlier in this discussion. Could you elaborate on them a little bit? Sure. Um, if we talk about data vault, we talk about modeling standards. There are three core components to every data vault model. Uh, we, hubs, links, and satellite. A hub is basically a set of unique business keys, period. Um, and so we're, we're looking constantly at the business for the business concepts upon which we are then searching and profiling our data to find the keys that are associated with those concepts. Um, the next object is called a link. A link is a unique set of relationships among the keys. And then finally, we have a satellite. Satellites are about the descriptive data. They're about history. So this is 
And, and the satellite uh, can be descriptive data around a relationship, which means it would be associated with a link, or around a hub, which means it's associated with business keys. So those are the core modeling objects in a data model as a standard. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that uh, when we, we started working with our business partners and I thought was great, and we discussed this a lot was understanding, you know, from the business side modeling more. And so the kind of having right away, our early discussions were if we're gonna embark on this journey, let's talk about our business ontology. Let's get that high level area start to, before we even start to do anything else, right? Because now I can kind of see some of my core entities and the things in within my business. In um, our business, the, the users that, and there were keys right now that we're working with, just love that fact that we're taking the time to do that. You know, when you talk about, a lot of times you talk about modeling, people will kind of give you the gloss over look like, why do we have to do that? Let's just jump in and start, you know, let's start constructing, let's start building. It's like, no, you know, take a step back because this all has a key role in order to make sure that the data vault structures will support the business. And that's been, that part's been been really good too. And it's it's fun to see when your business users start to kind of start to see how things kind of come together that way. Um, and it's exciting from that part too. But our from our perspective, it's been getting that business participation like has been like, you know, we've had good participation. Now we're really starting to get great participation because of kind of following this process. That's a Thank you. I know I could go on a rant on everything you just talked about, <laughs> but I won't, I promise. So the, some of the things you, you brought up are, are absolutely critical. Um, and I congratulate you for getting the business involved at that level. Um, there's a mix out there. Let me just talk about this business uh, collaboration. Um, when we work, when, 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 when the business started talking about, you know, agile, right? We were, were introducing agile methods and things like that. Well, how I, I don't know how many customers you've run into, but if you talk to certain business leaders, they say we're out agile. We're just we're fast. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, that's no, that's no not need the, to plan. Yeah. we don't plan. Right? We just do, right? We just, just <laughs> agile, like no planning. You don't need, you know, we don't need no stinking design. Like it's all these things that occur. And so um, the, this agile method we have, it requires and demands collaboration. So for the business to take, a, a business that not all of them do, for, but the businesses that, that take the perspective, we're going to be agile. And then they step away from the process altogether have missed the boat entirely, right? Central to every agile implementation, every agile team is the concept of collaboration, which we talk about in Data Vault. And to your point, the business must be involved. Data Vault is and always will be about the business and bringing business value. We start with the business, which is why in our in our uh, teaching and in our instruction, the methodology says you start with the business concept, right? We're not building data warehouses for the sake of churning through data. We're building data warehouses for the business and to bring the business value. You can't do that if you sit in a silo as an IT department and just look at the data and make your own assumptions, right? Yeah. Part of this is a shift in the way IT works. Another part is the shift in the way the business works. The business is notorious for bringing an IT group in and saying, give me all the data, mm -hmm. right? I want all the data. And so what we teach in agility, and then this is, this is part of the method is scope, right? We want to build within scope. And so what we teach our students is go back to the business, you start building a concept. And so, you want the business perspective. If you think about where business keys come from, they come from the result of business processes operating on a set of business concepts to deliver an outcome in a source system, right? Why would you think that you can do something like that in a vacuum just by looking at metadata in a schema? You have to go to the business. 
SOAR systems hold, and, and they're notorious for using sequence keys, right? Because people started, you know, space was, you know, at, you know, a premium, it was expensive. And so they were thinking, how, how do we store this, you know, as efficiently as possible? Those days are gone, but we have not broken the process of using sequence numbers as if somehow we still have this issue. Um, and so we used to be taught in data modeling we used to be taught how to find a business concept and represent that so that the business key had meaning, right? A sequence number has absolutely zero meaning to the record to which it points, nothing. And in Data Vault, we call that a non-deterministic value. You can't take any, any element of a record and, and basically tie a key to any element of a record when you have a non-deterministic key. We use hashes in Data Vault. You don't have to, which is something else people don't realize. The true key of any record is the key. Mm -hmm. And so you run into some, um, uh, some platforms that can't handle a composite key very well, right? And so, uh, uh, and I'll talk about this in a bit if we can we can get to it. But one of the things, the difference between Data Vault 1 and Data Vault 2, we're often asked is where did Data Vault 2 come from? And I'm going to get to your point on the business. But one of the one of the um, one of the foundational reasons there was a shift from Data Vault 1 to Data Vault 2 was the fact that we have uh, the introduction of these massively parallel processing environments. When Hadoop came on the scene, Dan was already ready for it 10 years earlier, right? The shift that came is that sequence numbers do not scale. And so when you have something like an MPP environment, right, and you have to deal with things like uh, data co-location, right, data distribution in order to take advantage of that platform and performance, you can't you can't create a hotspot in something like that. So, you know, Teradata has always been an MPP platform. It's engineered that way truly, right? But then we uh, Hadoop came into play and it became, MPP became like a commodity. It was an affordable option. You could build farms of servers with Hadoop and, and literally get that MPP capability. Um, and so for Data Vault, a sequence number, which was Data Vault 1, would not play in that environment. So the shift from Data Vault 1 to Data Vault 2 is focused on the fact that we are in uh, an environment that is not centralized, which I want to talk about at some point. But <laughs> so, so it, for the business, what we say is um, to address these, these issues, you have to find the key. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is absolutely critical to every team at, that is looking and, and profiling data. What is the key? And it's not just the key. You don't look at the source system and say, oh, it's a sequence number. That's my primary key. No, because what the enterprise has been asking for, what the business has been asking for is an integrated warehouse. They want to be able to look at their data across the breadth of all of their operations across the breadth of all of their source systems. And what have we done with data warehousing over the years? We built source system based silos. The data is not integrated at all. And so Data Vault, our key premise is that we are building an integrated enterprise warehouse that goes across, spans across all source systems to integrate on business concepts. If you're in a manufacturing operation, right? The concept of product, supplier, you know, delivery, all of those things, manufacturing process, all of those, uh, those concepts to the business actually boil down to various keys in the data. For example, product data is based on some kind of a product key based, you know, with a relationship to a supplier perhaps, right? And so, when we talk to the business, we have to talk to the business in their terms. IT is terrible at this sometimes, right? And so we have to go to the business and we say, you know, uh, when we look at the source system, 
you know, um, we're looking at your product. Uh, we're looking at your product system right now. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you define a product? What is a product to you? Not what's the product key? What is a product? What is, when you talk about product, what do you mean? When you talk about customer, what do you mean? Now, that's, mm -hmm. that is a, a huge battle to get into because if mm -hmm. you're talking about to finance, they're going to say, well, our customer is this company and this company and this company. You talk to sales, they're going to say, our customer is this person and this person and this person, mm -hmm. right? The grain of the term is completely different, right? A company is a group of individuals, right? And so when you have to help the business also understand, because oftentimes they, between their different uh, divisions and, and functional areas, they're using the same terms and they mean different things. And so the work that you're doing, Mike, the, is really, I commend you for this because most businesses don't have uh, an ontology or a taxonomy that defines the relationship of their business processes to their terminology. <laughs> and so one of the first things we do when we, when we teach our students is you know, go to the business concept. Here's a scenario, all right? And now how how do you get the business to tell you what the concept is? What is their concept of customer, for example? Is it the same? And this is funny. I was listening to a discussion on Mesh, and they're talking about, you know, context is missing and, you know, semantics and things like this. And I'm like, yeah, that should be done up front anyway, right? That's part of, of getting the concept uh, from the business. You know, because data is only understandable within the context in which it is placed. Um, and so when you when you talk to the business, you get that context, right? But you also get the semantics and the grain. Do they call a customer a customer or do they call it an account? If If finance calls it an account and marketing calls it a customer, different terms, but are they actually the same thing? That's that integration, right? And what you, you build in a data vault is you build to that level of integration of, of a customer so that when the C-suite folks want to report and they want to report on customer, because that's what the CEO recognizes, you give them a report on customer. But having said that, I talked about the different perspectives on the data. So if marketing says, you know, that's a customer, but finance says that's an account, you can give them the account, yeah. right? Because it's what you're storing is a concept, but the concept is understood and defined. So we talk about in data vault, we talk about that business concept coming through and, and naturally sort of folding, if you will, playing out to what we call an extended taxonomy. And what we do is we end up tying those system elements to the business terms. When you do that, you can begin to track the keys through the process, which is something that is extremely powerful um, because it's not something most data warehousing approaches even take into consideration. How do you know you have a broken process if you don't know how to trace the key through the entire life cycle of that business process across multiple source systems. That is a huge problem. And most people don't know how to do that, but we know how to do it. That's what we've been doing for 30 yeah. years. Yeah. yeah, it's a problem. And, you know, and, and, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I think this, and it kind of kind of ties into this next question, and I think we're gonna have some fun with it. But when you start to talk about, and this, uh, you know, like is Data Vault, a, the right fit of, for a solution for all data warehouses. Again, now the concepts are changing, right? What do you, and, and you're gonna, I know you're gonna tell us a little bit more about data warehouse, but I love the shift of the mentality to saying, what we deliver is really the information to an information mark. So our business users of differing departments, whatever can consume. So, so yeah, in, in data vault, does that, we already start talking about changing our, how we, what we call our warehouse at work. Do you find that a lot of people start to kind of struggle with the word data warehouse when they start working with data vault? So, um, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I, I tell my classes, my students, I can be a little shocking sometimes, but our industry is notorious for taking terms and bastardizing them. 
And data warehouse is one of those terms that that has occurred with. If you look at the definition of a data warehouse, the true definition of a data warehouse, Bill Inman gave us this back in the 80s. A data warehouse is a subject oriented, integrated by business key, time variant and non-volatile collection of data in support of management's decision-making process or in support of auditability as a system of record. Nowhere in Bill's definition, nowhere is there a discussion of structure, right? And so people say data warehouses, that's just for structured data. Really? Mm. No, it's not. Uh, and so uh, uh, so the whole concept of, of the data warehousing being tied to just structured data is so incorrect in a perspective, it's unbelievable to me. The other thing that you don't hear in this is you hear nothing in this about technology. There's nothing that says in bills that this, this is a collection on Hadoop. This is a collection of data that's stored in Oracle. This is a collection of data that's stored in a centralized location. That was never the concept. It was never the definition. And so Data Vault takes this idea of the true definition of a data warehouse because that's Bill Inman was mentoring Dan, right? So these concepts is the true concept of, of what a data warehouse is met beautifully with what Dan was working with because he had to deal with teams that were distributed globally, data that was distributed globally, right? And so data wasn't sitting in one place. And what we teach in Data Vault is that the beauty of the model and the methodology is it spans environments. It is not tied to any platform. <laughs> we use an ANSI SQL standard with, with uh, the, the builds, that's our recommendation. It is ubiquitous. It goes across all environments. And so we talk about data being in, you know, we have global companies that are doing this. They have data in Australia. Of course, we have, you know, data in Europe. Well, you've got GDPR issues, right? You can't move data across these boundaries, right? How do you, how do you solve these problems? And so we have an app for that. <laughs> so we, <there's, laughs> it's in the, it's in the approach, right? But, yeah. but the idea is that, you know, uh, Data Vault was built for these, for massively, uh, you know, globally distributed environments, both in data, in teaming, right, uh, adhering to different policies. You can imagine what it was like having to build something and throw it over the wall to the intelligence community, wherever they are, right, not break anything, maintain policy and standards. like. That doesn't happen by mistake. It happens through design and engineering. That's the only way that happens. And so Data Vault was always, always conceived, built, and implemented across multiple platforms, multiple infrastructures. So it's it, it's just this. And so when you, people will talk about this and they'll say, well, I don't have a, a system that's big enough for that. So what we generally say is unless you're like a mom and pop shop, with one cash register and you're never planning on expanding, don't build a data vault, it's over engineering. If you're a business that's growing, if you're a business that could be bought, <laughs> you know, think about that, or could be in a position to buy something else, you know, how do you ensure that, you know, you're actually building with resilience, right? So as things change, right, you can absorb those changes. We say you can, you should be able to build, you know, recommend it in, in, the, in a data vault fashion. You can take the methodologies, the architecture, the ways of working inside of a data vault, and you can apply them to a third normal form or a star schema. It will work every time, right? That's why it's more than the model. The model is an enabler, but it spans environments. And again, going back to, you know, why are there hash keys? Why was there a change from Data Vault 1 to Data Vault 2? Because we have to span environments, right? And we need a deterministic way to ensure that when we integrate on the business key, we have the same value. If I'm generating sequence keys for the same value coming off of a source system, I'm going to get a completely different key, right? But if I have a deterministic way of doing that, I can integrate. 
So, so that goes back to what is a hub? You know, it's a unique list of business keys. I can integrate on a single hub for this concept of customer. Guess what? I now have a way to actually enable my entire enterprise to look at customer and all of the history from any given source system tied to that key and be able to pull that together and report on it. So, um, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a beautiful thing. That is definitely a beautiful thing. <laughs> but that whole idea of building out an ontology, Mike, is absolutely perfect. That's where we teach people to start. You, you start with your ontology, you go to your taxonomy, right? Because there are different perspectives on the data. You identify what those business terms are. You tie those terms to the processes surrounding those terms. And then you tie them to the elements because from the process, you can find the actual data element that represents that key. If you think yep. about it, um, we get the business keys from a lot of different sources, but that's one way to do it. And then you're tracking all of that and you begin to see as data moves through the enterprise through these different systems and you can mm -hmm. track it. So it gives a great, a great view. It also, what you're touching on, if I, if I talk about that a little bit more is one of the benefits of, of a data vault is that it's not just a reporting out for uh, the business, your standard, you know, BI reports and analytics, right? In a data vault, one thing that is critical is that on your outcome, in your information delivery layer, you have a feedback loop. And that feedback loop goes back to the organization. So one of the benefits of data vault is not just this analytic capability, but it's also the ability to show the business where their processes are broken. Right, because one of the, the the reasons data warehouses have failed, we went to data lakes, now they're failing, right? No, no guess, no big surprise there, right? Because nothing's changed in the methodology. It's uh, the, the business says, you know, give me that easy button. Oh, I'm just gonna take, oh, you guys can't work fast enough in IT. I'm just gonna throw all this into a, you know, an S3 bucket, problem solved, you know, go report on the data, right? There's no governance, there's no, you know, there's no cataloging. Um, you know, there's there's no understanding of the data, right? And so you just throw it in a bucket and, you know, problem solved. No, not quite. It's the same problem, right? So the thing is with that is uh, you end up with technical debt, right? Because what happens is you still are collecting the same garbage from the source systems, right? And so what happens, the business says, you know, okay, IT, give me all the data, you know, throw it in a data lake, you know, and then, you know, I want you to fix all these data problems. Well, first of all, you will need to report back to the business when you find garbage data, because that should be an indicator of one of two things. You have a broken source system process because that garbage should never be able to flow through, right? Or you need training in your functional areas on how to get the data. It's one of two things, honestly. And so how does the business know that? How can the how can we talk about continuous improvement when all of the garbage has to flow down to the warehouse and then they tell the, the IT teams, fix the data? The data is an indicator, it's a symptom of a larger problem. And so we talk about a feedback loop. And from the feedback loop in Data Vault, we have things called error marts and metrics vaults, right? They're they're optional components of the data vault, but basically they're capturing and tracking all the errors. How many teams filter out null business keys? Well, that's a null record. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pull that into the data warehouse. Really? That's important because if my source system is passing data that uh, records that have a null key on them, you have a huge problem because the, the UI on the front end of that source system isn't going to ever pull that data back. And there's this idea, the business says, my data looks like this, and IT grabs all the data, and we're like, nope, the data really looks like this, right? So the enterprise is hemorrhaging cost because they keep pushing the cost of maintaining that data down to the warehouse because it's like, you guys, uh, you ever watch Galaxy Quest? Are you familiar with the movie Galaxy Quest? Oh, like the Star Trek parody. Great movie because... You know, at one point they're like, 
you know, they're talking to help us, commander, we need your help, right? They're, they're sort of, they're, they're desperate. And, and what it is, is what, that's what happens in our, in our, in our dear warehousing projects. The, the business says, you know, you fix the data. We are the last, like the last bastion before the, the data is actually consumed, you know, in, in an outcome in the, to the, by the consumers, right? And so we, all this technical debt falls on, on the data warehouse team. And oh, by the way, it happens over and over again because it's never corrected at the source. So that feedback loop that comes out of information delivery layer is a total quality management aspect. It's part of master data aspect, right? And we loop that back to the source system, to the business and say, you need to fix this data. You either need to train your teams or you have a broken process. You are hemorrhaging revenue through this system right now because we're having your, we are, it's being paid for. And what happens is they, they come back and they say, data warehouse is too expensive. It takes too long, you know, and, you know, we're going to greenfield it and start all over again. And the problem in often, often case is the fact that the source systems are broken, they're not corrected, and the business keeps pushing that technical debt downstream on the IT department. If you can provide that feedback and they start cleaning that up, the quality overall, right, inside the warehouse goes up. But guess what? You have a continuous improvement for the enterprise overall. When their data begins to reflect properly what it should, they are more efficient, right? They're not. so. It's, it's it's actually a beautiful feedback loop, you know, and that extends even to data science. So um, for for folks that are looking at, you know, um, this idea of, 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 you know, data marts and, and you know, um, uh, this this sort of struggle that that you were talking about with regard to, you know, um, uh, who. Uh, who should build a data vault and what is it, its, its advantage, right? Um, I'm going to go back and say anyone that's serious about actual data governance, master data, understanding their data, and flexibility and scalability should be building in data vault style, all right, and, and with that kind of rigor. And from a end user consumer point of view is when you give them that trustworthy data, that is auditable. That is traceable, right? Uh, that is quality cleansed to a certain extent, right? Whatever needs to happen there. Um, and you uh, uh, apply the business rules from their perspective, right? They get a consistent answer. And, and your C-suites and your upper management begin to get consistent answers out of the warehouse. And we can tell them when there's an inconsistency because a BI user took our outcome and did something else with it. We can audit to what we delivered. We can always show the business, this was a calculation you gave us, for example. This is the calculation that we have codified and version controlled. Where it goes from here, right, that is, that is on the business users, you know, to, uh, to answer to. But we can always prove that we've, we've done this piece correctly. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> that was great. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners and viewers what they can do to learn more about Data Vault? You've had a lot of great insight. You've shared a lot of great things. Anything else? What should I be looking at? What should the audience be looking at to learn more about Data Vault? Sure. I would encourage folks, I will give you some links, but I would encourage uh, folks to go to datavaultalliance.com. Uh, that is the Data Vault Alliance uh, central uh, website. Uh, you can find out um, about Data Vault. There are some videos. Uh, and uh, the other thing I would encourage them to do is attend the Worldwide Data Vault Conference. Last year, uh, we focused on data science, and we haven't even discussed that here today, but data, data science is tremendously enabled by Data Vault. We had some great speakers last year. We had uh, Richard Strange, he's a PhD candidate at Oxford University that has used Data Vault extensively in a number of his modeling algorithms and, um, and just loves it. Uh, we had um, 
Heli from Finland. Heli is an uh, Oracle ACE director. She's also a professor at the University of Helsinki studying, working on her PhD uh, in artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, Heli uses Data Vault consistently. In fact, she usually goes to the classes that we teach in Finland nearly every year just to refresh and, and learn something new. Um, and so as a data science enabler, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about that, we have uh, recordings um, on Data Vault Alliance for uh, some of the sessions or, or glimpses of the sessions. Um, uh, there is a, a users group. So there is a new users group. We stood up North American Data Vault users group. Uh, there's on a meetup and I can give you the URL for that and just come join us there. Um, Dan is a regular, like he does, we, we do tips and tricks from Dan or, you know, it's just a quick blurb, but <clears throat> we talk about customer success stories. Uh, and we also talk about, you know, approaches in Data Vault and how to correctly build. Um, so uh, you can look at um, uh, Data Rebels uh, has a website. There's a little bit out there on that. I'm, um, I've got a few blogs, but uh, there's also, uh, you can get information from danlinstead.com. Dan has been blogging for years and years. If you really want to go do a deep dive uh, on any given subject or aspect of Data Vault, uh, you can find a blog that Dan has written in, in danlinstead.com. There's also review learn all data thirty thousand. Pardon? Review all review all thirty thousand of I these know. cases. I it's, know it's, it's extensive, <laughs> right? Um, so those would be the resources. The other thing I would say is, if you really want to go deeper, um, you can. I would I would highly recommend someone attend a class. I have uh, frequently. I'll have uh, one person from a team come in and train and really get uh, the the um, the deep dive. Uh, of Data Vault 101 with the methodology, the concepts and things like that. Uh, we have, there are four uh, authorized training partners in the world globally. We have uh, eight authorized instructors globally. So there aren't a lot of us around. Um, so uh, if people are in uh, the uh, ANZ you know, Australia, New Zealand, our partner Certus Solutions is an authorized training partner. Uh, in Europe, they can uh, talk to Scale Free. Um, we also do uh, work with Ari Hovi or Hovi Competencies. They offer our training classes in Finland. Um, and in the US, there are two, two companies that are authorized training partners, uh, Performance G2. Uh, and my company, Data Rebels. And so uh, they can get training and, or look at our training schedules. The Data Vault Alliance website has our training schedules as well. Um, so I would encourage people to actually uh, dig deeper. The other uh, resource would be uh, the book that Dan wrote with Michael Oshimka uh, back in 2015. It's called Building a Scalable Data Warehouse with Data Vault 2.0. It is a bit dated. It does need an errata, but if you want to get a, a, a high-level overview of Data Vault 2, that would be another place to go um, to look. Kent Graziano from Snowflake is in the process of rewriting the um, uh, the Data Vault 1 book, um, and so that's probably going to be coming out. But uh, Kent is also a Data Vault master um, and uh, has been working with Dan for like 15 years or so too. So. Uh, there are a lot of great resources. Uh, Kent has a blog called uh, The Data Warrior, and uh, he frequently talks about Data Vault um, on that blog as well. Um, so great resources out there. Yeah, sounds pretty extensive. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll get together and make sure that those uh, all those resources end up in the show notes and the description. So I appreciate that. Okay. All right. Mike, thank you so much for co-hosting. Cindy. You've been an awesome guest. I thank you for coming on. Thank you both. And uh, listeners and viewers, uh, make sure you subscribe and like the videos and all that good stuff. And uh, we'll see you at the next episode. Thank you, Bob, for having me. And Mike, it was great talking with you. Nice to meet you. This was awesome, guys. Thank you so much. It was a great morning. Thanks. Yep. Bye.